When discussing genome editing with people, I think it's really important to be consistent with the language that you're using. Um, so try and stick to one term rather than using a whole range of different terms to explain the same thing. Um, but I think it's really interesting that the public um, you know, have a wide range of knowledge and understanding already. And I think it's very important that we don't assume that people know very little or know a lot. And therefore, you know, exploring what people already know and tapping into the conversations they're already having. People are interested in genetics. It's about themselves. Um, it's about the world around them. So I think people are naturally curious about it. And it's just important to kind of tap into that curiosity that already exists in the way they're already talking about genetics um, and using that to be able to have you know, a discussion around what they think about genome editing and how it might be used in the future. So I think as a researcher engaging with the public on genome editing, the most important is to turn their, their language and level of understanding to the target audience, to the person you're speaking with. So it's not necessary that much to share the technical details and the functioning itself of the technique, but more the overview of how it works and actually its relevance for the future, for the impact. It's always a challenge to try and explain to the, to the public, to a lay person, what it is that you do. Because you're used to talking to people in academic conferences in, in, in the jargon and nomenclature that you use in, in everyday scientific conversation. You can't do that when you're speaking to the public. So you have to, you, it's, and it's up to you to simplify your message, to allow them to understand what it is you do. And what you actually usually discover is that people are immensely curious and interested in the sort of research that we all do. And, and that in itself is very gratifying, but then it allows you to actually have a conversation with them about what it is you do. And they ask you questions and say, well, why do you want to do that? Is it important? Is it safe? And those are questions that probably a lot of the time you necessarily haven't really thought about in any real depth. But now it gives you a chance to do that. So I, I think it's, it's a great thing to do. I really encourage people that I work with to, to, to do it because I think it's, it's, it's a way of making a, a, a more whole scientist, if you like, so, it's, so that you're actually connected to the real world. I think the first thing is to get the idea that sort of we've kind of read the human genome and I think that's something which um, is kind of uh, most people will have heard of, most people have come, apart, come across. Um, and the fact that this is actually a way that we can actually change that sequence and um, repair things that are wrong with it or things that are right with it. And I think the, the thing that's come out of the CRISPR side of things is that we're now able to position those scissors very accurately. So it, we're actually able to put those into a specific site in the genome, which I think is really the, that's really the, the, the extension that's happened in the last few years. I always say, okay, you wanna know about CRISPR? Let me explain to you how the genome works. Literally, how do you go from being one cell to being trillions of cells walking around? And I think that is absolutely necessary when you're talking about genome editing because the, the value of a genome isn't intrinsically under, understandable or accessible to anybody. The, the value becomes apparent when you understand how it instructs cells and how you start off with one single version of your genome and how modifying that therefore has global ramifications, basically, both for your body, for your children, and for others around you, potentially. So yes, baseline knowledge, very important. The most common metaphor and kind of analogy for um, your, your genome is, it is talking about a book, really, and so that is very useful because it's, it's a visual example of how you would read a book and you would read your genome or sequence your genome. And I think metaphor is very useful, you know, so the, the kind of, the, the ones that a lot of people have used are kind of cutting and pasting or, um, or the analogy to a word processor where you actually edit a sequence of DNA. Um, a lot of people use the word scissors um, and scalpels, molecular scalpels or sort of um, DNA surgery, that kind of thing. Um, and I think they're, they're all very useful. Um, I think you do have to be a little bit careful that they don't overplay what we're, what we're doing. Um, so uh, in many cases, it's not quite as precise as a surgeon's scalpel. I think it's, I think it's kind of a little bit more of a more, more um, it's not quite as elegant as that. It's, 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 it's a little bit more crude. Um, but equally that it doesn't prevent you from extending those analogies as well. So you know, there's a lot of other applications like CRISPR-A and CRISPR-I. Um, and base editing, um, all of which fall under the same umbrella, 
um, but they're acting through quite different mechanisms. And I do think it is important to try and find the right words to explain the, the principles that underline uh, gene editing. You know, sometimes I talk about it with I'm talking to, 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 to people who are not expert in the field. I would, you know, maybe say, well, um, you know, think of it as a, in, in an incredibly precise pair of scissors that allows you to cut the DNA at, at a particular point in, in, in the sequence. Um, uh, you know, and I guess you can try and build that, meta that sort of metaphor up and even talk about it in a more sort of slightly, and it's a bit of a mixing your metaphors because you talk about saying, well, it's like a programmable uh, um, pair of scissors. So you can sort of like put your, put your program into the scissors and it knows exactly where to find the particular target that it wants to cut in the DNA. But I think, so, you, so I guess what I'm saying is that tells you you need to think quite carefully about the best way to try and explain what it is you're doing um, to, to people who don't understand, you know, what a genome is, or maybe don't understand what DNA is, or, or the fact that DNA is made up of a, it's just a code of four letters. So there's sometimes a, a concern for scientists engaging in this debate that, um, the terminology is quite often quite slippery or it might be factually incorrect. You know, you have common parlance ways of talking about these things that might include phrases like, you know, designer babies, for example. And I guess from my experience of having been involved with public dialogue activities on a whole range of past technologies would be not to get too hung up on that sort of stuff. Because actually phrases like that I see as sort of ways into the public discussion, access points for a, for a, uh, a public debate. Truthfully, I don't think you need to get into the molecular details at all. I, I know even scientists who are well versed in, in genetics who, who haven't in, engaged with the, the fundamental workings of the enzymes and you know, the process itself. Um, I think for the public's point of view, it's, it's quite, quite simply a case of talking about, you know, cut and paste really um, and even and even with that you don't necessarily have to newer methods of genome editing like base editing you don't need to cut the DNA at all so it's it can it, it's nice to describe it as find and replace mechanism for repairing or altering certain um, genes if you want to explain the technology to people you need to try and yeah not get bogged down in jargon and talking about crispr cas9 and enzymes and whatever i think you need to just try and explain it to them in a way that they understand and you have to sense check that with them to actually make sure as you're having that discussion that dialogue do they understand what you're saying because a lot of the time they say yes yes i understand but actually they, they maybe don't understand so it's it's, it's all about dialogue. It's about checking that you've actually, what you've said has been understood in the way that you want it to be understood. Genetic Alliance UK and the Progress Educational Trust got together to talk about genome editing and we saw its discussion in the media was growing and we thought um, that it would be valuable to build a framework for that discussion to happen so that our constituents for Genetic Alliance UK people living with rare genetic conditions and for the Progress Educational Trust, the fertility community, would have a good framework to engage with the, um, the topic. So we were seeing terms like gene editing, genome editing, genome engineering thrown around, um, CRISPR, um, used uh, equally, but uh, for our members, we were sure they weren't necessarily grasping that they were all the same thing. So we had some workshops where we brought in scientists using uh, genome editing tools and uh, some ethicists to talk about genome editing and explain what's going on and where the, the, the potential of the, the technology is. And using the outcomes of those workshops, we came up with a list of uh, ideas for scientists to communicate on genome editing with um, and a list of hints and tips to do that. So one of the rules that we suggest is that you only use the term genome editing um, and that you're precise about uh, what the scope of the work that you're doing is. We also suggest that we don't necessarily need complex metaphors to describe the, um, the approach that actually editing is a well understood term and that the more someone understands what a genome is, the more they might understand what genome editing is. In terms of prior knowledge, I think for an activity people don't have to have any. You do have to explain what genome editing is and I think the idea of 
scissors and editing is the best way to do that without being too scientific. You don't need to necessarily go into the detail of different types of enzymes. Um, obviously the importance of specificity is important um, with CRISPR, which I think is a key point to get across, as well as the cut and paste mechanism so that people can understand that you're making fundamental changes. Um, it's not just about switching off or things, it's about fundamentally changing the DNA. So when talking to the public, I would say there are very two good advices. One of them is the use of metaphors, whether that works for you as a word editor that finds and replaces a word, or whether it is a satnav that guides something to a specific point, or whether it's a melding tool that comes like surgeons when they perform an operation and they fix something inside the body. There are several metaphors. But also another key, um, another key tip when engaging is reiteration because not everybody has the same level of understanding. Just make sure that you repeat the things in several different ways. With genome editing, it's, I, I specifically want to highlight that the words genome editing should be used, not gene editing, not genetic modification, not gen genetic engineering. We should be consistent with genome editing. Um, and that is because as the technology progresses, there are different parts about genome editing that will, that will change. And, it's important to remember that genome editing encompasses previous technologies, so calling many people have a propensity to call genome editing CRISPR, and they say, are you doing CRISPR, or a CRISPR, there's a CRISPR clinical trial, and then when you dig down into the clinical trial, actually they're not using CRISPR, they're using the previous versions of, the, of genetic engineering, or talons and, and zinc finger nucleases. So if everyone's stuck with, the, with genome editing, it's a lot more accurate for all people involved. In terms of using metaphors, I would say it depends on your audience. You don't want to be condescending. Um, cut and paste is a really clear way of talking about um, genome editing, but then if you have a younger um, pop, um, audience, if you have a younger audience, then using Lego, um, talking about making changes using games or Lego that they might be interested in is a really good way of doing it. But you can apply anything to cutting and pasting and genome editing. Another thing about language is there's a real trend for scientists to talk about genes as, as, as proteins, which they are, but for the vast majority of people when you talk about protein, they think you're talking about chicken or eggs. Um, and so to try and step away from your laboratory-based, you know, lab meeting discussion type terminology about significance or about proteins or about expression. Expression to most people is what you have on your face. It's it the, the language of expression of proteins really doesn't translate to a lot of people, and so the message gets lost about what you're talking about. It's much easier to talk about genes and their relative function or maybe that the presence of a gene or the importance of a gene um, in, in, in describing what a gene is going to do. I think a good way for scientists to get into that conversation is not to talk about what they know and what they're certain about, but to talk about what they're uncertain about. You know, to say in effect, we have these new possibilities, we have these new results, but we're not sure. We, they could take us this way, they could take us that way. And as soon as you have that conversation, you are engaging with the public as equals and you're saying, let's talk about where this might take us together.